Um, good afternoon. My name is Lindsay. I'm the manager of planning with the Invasive Species Council of BC. Along with doing some of the organizational operations, my portfolio includes our programs with the horticulture, pet and aquarium, and tourism industries. So today I'm here to speak to you about the connection between invasive species and tourism. We'll start by talking about why this is important, discuss some easy best practices to incorporate into tourism activities, and talk about how you might be able to share this message with operators in your region. This webinar is a follow-up to the one that was hosted earlier in March, um, which was specifically for recreation-based tourism operators. That recording is up on our website. And after the session, we actually had quite a few inquiries asking for um, another, another session that was uh, geared a little bit more broadly outside of that specific um, group of tourism operators. So we wanted to invite you all to join us today uh, to learn about this topic. Here we are. Thank you so much for your interest and for being here. Um, if you have questions, please pop them into the Q&A box. I'll address all of those at the end. As I mentioned, this webinar is being recorded, so it will also be available on our website in the next couple of days. And as I've mentioned, please do feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Megan, we can go to the next slide. All right, so before we begin exploring the intersections between invasive species and tourism, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge the Cynix people whose traditional territories include the community of Rossland, where I'm joining you from today. On behalf of our team at the Council, I also gratefully acknowledge the territories of the Indigenous people across BC, where we all live and work to maintain healthy ecosystems for all. Indigenous peoples have been stewards of these lands since time immemorial, and through the tourism program, we hope to increase capacity for ecological stewardship across the tourism sector. Next slide, please. So a quick introduce, uh, introduction to who we are here at ISCBC. We are the largest provincial invasive species organization in Canada. We are a nonprofit and a founding member and co-chair of the Canadian Council on Invasive Species. Our focus is on outreach, education, training, and collaborative responses to major emerging issues. We're guided by a diverse board of directors with representation from federal, provincial, indigenous, and regional governments, First Nations, industries, the recreation recreation and tourism sector and environmental groups. And our mission is to take action to build healthy landscapes, habitats and communities through education and responsible practices to prevent the introduction and spread of invasive species. Next slide. So just a quick overview of our objectives with this session. By the end of the presentation, our goal here is that everyone will have an understanding of the impacts of invasive species on BC's tourism industry, how invasive species can be spread by tourism activities, how to take action to protect BC's biodiversity, and how to share these messages with tourism operators in your region. As I mentioned, we have hosted um, a session specifically for operators, but we did have quite a few inquiries from uh, tourism adjacent organizations who wanted to learn a little bit more. Next slide, please, Megan. So I just want to start with a little bit of background on tourism in BC. Uh, BC's tourism industry is ranked as one of the most important sectors to our economy. It generates billions of dollars annually. BC is also a very popular, <clears throat> pardon me, destination for travelers worldwide, and it's known for its incredible diversity of natural landscapes, wildlife, and wild spaces. According to the Wilderness Tourism Association of BC in 2018, wilderness tourism is a main driver of tourism in BC. BC's destination brand, Supernatural British Columbia, and the province's biodiversity, wild spaces, and healthy ecosystems are all a key aspect of what attracts visitors and what helps run this um, really important industry. So invasive species have the capacity to negatively impact BC's environment, ecosystems, and biodiversity, and therefore directly impact the tourism industry that relies on um, relies on that biodiversity and those ecosystems. The InvasiveWise tourism program was developed to address these concerns, especially as tourism activity is likely to continue to increase in the coming years. When visitors come to BC, they can help protect BC's biodiversity by preventing the introduction and spread of invasive species. And you'll also find, and I'll talk a, lo a lot about this um, through the presentation, but staff in tourism industries also have a huge role to play. All right, next slide, please, Megan. 
So um, I want to just start with a little bit of Terminology 101. We do have quite a broad range of folks that uh, registered for this webinar. I see a couple of colleagues from regional invasive species organizations. So glad to have you here. Thanks for coming. Um, this will be something that you're familiar with already. But for those of you from the tourism sector or others who might not be so familiar, let's look at some terminology. So what is an invasive species? Invasive species are non-native plants, animals, and microorganisms that negatively impact the environment, economy, and society. They can rapidly establish and spread out compete, uh, sorry, compete for food, shelter, and space with native species, reduce biodiversity, and destroy habitats that support entire ecosystems. They disrupt food webs and compete with native species, that, including those that are rare or endangered for resources. They also have the potential to spread disease and introduce parasites. They have significant impacts on our economy, including agriculture, forestry, hydroelectric, and tourism, and other sectors as well. And they also can impact human health, recreation, and even the value of land. Invasive species cost BC millions of dollars per year, both in terms of loss of revenue um, coming from different uh, different sectors that rely on healthy ecosystems, and also in terms of expense for invasive species management. Next slide, please, Megan. So tourism. Um, tourism is a major pathway for the introduction and spread of invasive species and has been identified as such by the International Union of Conservation of Nature. Therefore, the tourism industry is also a critical partner in preventing the impacts of invasive species in BC. And I'm sure most folks on this call understand the importance of BC's natural areas and biodiversity for the tourism industry. We've talked about that a little bit already, and, and that will certainly be a theme as we move forward. Tourism operators often have direct access to visitors well before they arrive in BC, and they so they have the um, opportunity to take some proactive measures to connect with tourists around invasive species prevention. And it's also important to note that we're not just talking about international visitor, visitors here um, as those who have the capacity to introduce and spread invasive species, BC residents, um, who are traveling as well as the folks who work in the tourism sector also um, have the potential to imp or, uh, spread invasive species and therefore also have a super important role to play in protecting the province's biodiversity. Our Invasive Wise Tourism Program was developed to support wilderness and recreation-based tourism operators in adopting simple best management practices to prevent the introduction and spread of invasive species. The overall goal of this program is to protect species at risk and BC's rich biodiversity from the threats of invasive species by focusing on high risk pathways, such as the movement of invasives by tourists, anglers, boaters, float planes, and recreationists. Next slide, please, Megan. So there's a couple more useful terms for understanding how invasive species spread that I just want to share here. Pathways are any means or routes by which invasive species are introduced or spread. Tourism and tourism activities like boating, fishing, driving, ATVing, horseback riding, biking, hiking, those are all pathways of spread. Vectors are any non-living or non-living carrier that introduces and spreads invasive species either intentionally or unintentionally. So invasive animals, seeds, plant fragments, they can all hitchhike on, um, on different vectors. So they attach to the vectors or the carriers and are transported to new locations. So that's really what we're looking at here when we're looking at um, invasive wise tourism is, is present, preventing that um, transportation. So vectors associated with tourism activities include camping gear, uh, watercraft, vehicles, float planes, helicopters, animals, um, for example, you're taking your dog out, fishing gear, as well as just any of your equipment that you might be using. So anything that comes into contact with an invasive species can be a vector. The terms pathway and vector can be confusing to remember, but I think the important thing here is that engaging in tourism activities does create the potential to introduce and spread invasive species. Next slide, please. I think this is a pretty crazy picture um, if you take a look at the screen there. So in the next few slides, I just want to offer some context for why this is so important. So we're going to dive into some of the large scale impacts of invasive species, um, starting with environmental impacts. 
Um, so I think we'll just break these down into competition, predation, habitat, alteration, and biodiversity loss. So invasive species, as I've mentioned, increase competition by outcompeting native species for food, space, and other resources. And this is particularly concerning for species at risk, which do rely on um, these things for their survival, not only as individuals, but for entire species. Um, invasive species can also directly prey on native species, and that's what you see on the screen here. They're often and considered general predators, so they have a pretty wide range of what they will consume. Um, an example of that is the invasive largemouth bass. It's an omnivore feeding on plankton, small fish, amphibians, insects, crustaceans, and even young turtles. So this invasive species has serious potential to disrupt entire food webs um, because of how general its predation is uh, when it's introduced into a habitat in BC. When we look at habitat alteration, uh, invasive species can physically change the environment and disrupt essential ecosystems. For example, several aquatic invasive plant species grow in dense mats that block sunlight. They can change chemical composition of water, shade out other aquatic plants, and slow water movement. These mats are often so thick that swimming or boating becomes impossible or can even be dangerous. Um, finally, as as you all know, wildlife, one of the main drivers of tourism in BC, as I mentioned, uh, unfortunately, due to all of the reasons that I've mentioned above, invasive species do lead to overall loss of biodiversity, which can be defined as the variety of life within a given ecosystem, so something so important to tourism here in BC. Uh, because invasive species have the capacity to take over ecosystems where they are introduced, they effectively stifle, alter, or eliminate the native ecosystems or habitats that this biodiversity uh, relies on to survive and thrive. So the impacts on the environment are well documented. These are just kind of a high level look at it. There's no surprise that invasive species are recognized globally as a second leading cause of biodiversity loss. The number one cause being habitat loss, which um, as I've spoken to in many cases could uh, be attributed to invasive species as well. Next slide, please, Megan. So I want to talk a little bit about economic impacts here. Um, this photo is uh, from Parks Control at Ruckel Point Park on Salt Spring Island, I believe, and you're looking at um, control of carpet burrweed. So we'll talk about that um, in terms of expenses, but just some, some contents text for what that is. Um, so invasive species impact every sector of the tourism industry and they can lead to a loss of revenue. As I talked about in the previous slide, invasive species can have a huge impact both on the landscape and the wildlife that lives within it. <clears throat> Any tourism operation that relies on the natural environment may see revenue loss associated with devastation caused by infestations of invasive species, and it really is our responsibility to steward these ecosystems and prevent that from happening and ensure that uh, they can continue to support life and tourism for future generations. So infestations of invasive species can also lead to added management costs, like I said with the picture from Ruckel Park there, um, including staff time, training, and specialized equipment to control infestations, as well as additional maintenance costs for other gear and equipment that come into contact with invasive species. For example, invasive zebra and quagga mussels stick into the surface of boats and motors, and we'll show you a picture of that shortly, but this impacts not only the environment, but the integrity and longevity of equipment like boats and therefore also um, influences our ability to get out on the water and costs associated with that. Certain invasive species can also lead to a decrease in property values, for example, <clears throat> pardon me, invasive knotweed plants um, can grow extremely quickly from uh, the smallest fragment and even grow through concrete foundations. In the UK, Japanese knotweed has been um, extremely difficult for homeowners there and selling their properties can be really challenging because um, banks actually refuse to lend mortgages on affected properties. So not a local example there, but um, uh, one that I think is, is really um, vivid in terms of you know, what this can mean for individuals. Finally, invasive species can lead to decreased aesthetic value by altering the landscape. And I think it's fair to say that the majority of um, visitors to our beautiful province are expecting to experience a pristine nature um, 
that we have here in BC and the incredible landscapes and thinking back to how invasive species can dominate dominate those entire landscapes um, the loss of of biodiversity and that change that can be caused by invasive species can be associated with a decrease in aesthetic value and a therefore a decrease in, in um, interest in the area next slide thanks Megan all right so um social impacts. Some invasive species can threaten the health and safety of people that come into contact with them. Most of you are probably familiar with the native species that could cause harm in your local ecosystem, um, but a novel invasive species is a bit of a wild card. So you might have heard in the news recently about an invasive plant called giant hogweed uh, here in Vancouver. Big uh, news story around that. It produces a highly toxic sap that can cause burns, blisters, and scarring when touched. Um, and it's also in uh, the pollen can do this as well. And so we really want to make sure that we're eliminating eliminating the spread of these species to protect our uh, well-being. And and um, my my partner is a um, wilderness guide, and I imagine him on a, a kayaking trip deep in one of the inlets in BC, needing to administer some pretty advanced first aid um, if someone was to experience something like uh, the gentleman who was blinded by. Um, giant hogweed, hogweed uh, temporarily in Vancouver. So something to think about there is, is it's about safety too for um, visitors. So certain invasive species can also reduce um, the ability that people have to support themselves and their families. For example, the brown memorated stink bug, which is an invasive insect, feeds on agricultural crops and wild species. Um, another example of that for the horticulture uh, sector is the Japanese beetle. Um, so the brown memorated stink bug, bug causes damage to fruits, makes crops uh, unharvestable, and impacts regional food and wine production. Um, also important to note that invasive species can have huge impacts on Indigenous communities and traditional practices. As we now know, invasive species can outcompete native species, many of which are used traditionally and in an ongoing way for foods, medicines, and ceremonial practices by Indigenous people. And finally, uh, invasive species can reduce recreational opportunities by blocking access to trails and shorelines. Imagine a thicket of prickly Himalayan blackberry bushes or um, thistles blocking access to the trails that you want to visit while out um, exploring BC. So, and as we've talked about already, they can also reduce water quality, damage equipment and gear, um, et cetera. So it has an effect on our, our ability to recreate as well. Next slide, please. So here's that photo that I was talking about with um, the invasive mussels. Just a quick summary of the slides that we've talked about already. So tourism activities um, bring travels to travelers to ecologically sensitive areas like parks, biodiversity hotspots, and remote wilderness sites. And invasive species can hitch a ride there uh, through those activities, as we talked about with pathways and vectors. So once established, invasive species have wide ranging and costly environmental, economic, and social impacts, including impacts to the tourism sector. A great example of vectors of spread and the subsequent impacts of an invasive species can be seen in zebra and quagga mussels, which are both high alert early detection rapid response species here in BC. And I say it's a great example, but it's really kind of a disheartening example, actually. Um, these invasive freshwater mussels are native to the Black Sea in Europe, but they have been introduced to Ontario, Quebec, and Manitoba. They have not yet been detected in BC, but they are spread through water bodies or between water bodies, I should say, when they stick to boat hulls, motors, trailers, angling gear, like what you can see on the photo here, um, plane floats, other equipment and gear that comes into contact. Um, through infested waters, and their larvae can be transported in the smallest amounts of standing water. So we'll talk a little bit about clean, drain, dry quickly, but I think this is, a, like I said, a good example to illustrate why this is so important. Um, zebra and quagga mussels hit all of the major impact zones, including our economy, our society, and the environment. Infestations can clog pipes and water intake uh, systems affecting hydroelectric facilities. Uh, facilities, but they also can damage boats, docks, and waterfront infrastructure. 
The shells are extremely sharp and can cut um, both people and wildlife moving in that area. Once established in a water body, they become pretty prolific and are impossible to get rid of. The province has built boat inspection stations at BC borders um, that stop all watercraft during the boating season to look for these mussels as well as other invasive species. But a critical step in preventing the spread of mussel movement um, does lie with people who are operating um, tourism businesses that are aquatic based. So it's really important to ensure that watercraft um, is uh, properly cleaned to prevent the spread of mussels and other aquatic invasive species, all the water drained out and that they are dried. Mussels, these mussels can live up for up to 30 days outside of water. Um, so it really kind of drives that point home just how important that is. So I want to start to talk a little bit about taking action and this um, I'll, I'll uh, provide a, an overview. Megan, you can move to the next slide, please. Thanks so much. But I'll provide a little bit of an overview of our uh, Invasive Wise Tourism Program. But this is some of the content that we are trying to um, share with tourism operators. So the Invasive Wise uh, Tourism Program has developed easy to follow best practices for tourism operators, staff and visitors to use before, during and after their activities to prevent the spread of invasives. And let's take a quick look or a closer look, sorry. But before we do, I just want to acknowledge that many tourism operators in BC are already doing incredible ecological stewardship work. Um, this is you know something that's often integrated into these businesses and these simple best practices that we're going to talk about you'll see they're fairly easy to um, adopt and adapt into existing stewardship and operational models next next slide please megan Awesome. So I've talked about clean, drain, dry a few times here. Um, that's one of the biggest messages we're trying to promote. Um, clean, drain and dry your material if you are using that in water bodies. So clean off all plants, animals, insects, mud, any debris uh, from boats and gear. Drain all the water from your boat and gear. Um, pull any plugs dump out any um, hatches or holes and dry all parts of your gear and boat completely um, before you're getting into the water. And, and you may think this sounds a little counterintuitive if you're drying off your boat before getting into the water, but this is something that can take you literally a matter of minutes. For example, if you've got a kayak or paddle board uh, or canoe or whatever that might be, or if you're um, about to, to back your boat trailer up into the water. So just take a minute, give it a good clean, a good quick thorough clean and you're um, really going a long way to preventing the spread of aquatic invasive species. Uh, recreational boats can be a major vector of spread. Um, we do have a large boating community and the province with so many beautiful pristine uh, lake and freshwater areas is highly susceptible, um, especially due to the proximity to the US and multiple entry points into the province. So this is a big issue when small watercraft are transported to these natural areas that might not see very many visitors or might not be exposed to invasive species otherwise. So this is just really important, um, a small step to take to prevent that. So like we were talking about with the mussels, invasive species can attach to very all different areas of your boat, um, including hulls, propellers, ballast tanks, live wells, etc. Um, also, like I was saying, more generally, um, your angling gear, paddling gear, all that jazz, um, you can take these small steps to help prevent the spread of invasives just by ensuring your watercraft and your gear are cleaned, drained and dry before and after every use. Um, so before land-based activities, we do ask that people, again, similarly remove plants, insects, debris, mud, boots, um, anything that's on your gear from uh, sorry, and mud from your boots or gear, pet vehicles, anything that you're bringing with you, just make sure it's uh, clean. And these are great things that you can do not only to prevent the spread of invasive species, but also just to take good care of your gear and make it last for a long time. So um, this is something that's really great to promote to folks coming to visit BC so they can think about ensuring things like their hiking boots are clean before they pack up and leave home. Um, I think one good example of this, when I was visiting New Zealand, um, they have 
a pretty extensive um, invasive species management program at the federal level. And when you arrive, if you declare that you have any camping gear, you actually do have to take it out and it is inspected. So uh, we don't necessarily have that infrastructure at the airport here the way that they do in New Zealand, but that is still the, a concept that you can promote as um, you know folks in the tourism sector to guests as they're planning their trip and um, you know make sure your stuff is clean before you come over here and then you got clean gear when you arrive and and your photos will look great so um as I've said already, when recreating outdoors, invasive species can easily hitch a ride. Um, and that is both between uh, different trailheads. So if you're moving from one area to another, but also like I mentioned with that example in New Zealand, um, you know, if someone's coming over from a different country that might have different species, we don't wanna risk them being introduced over here and becoming invasive. So um, clean off your gear, clean off your pets. Um, seeds, plant parts, they're easily transported also in tires, ATVs, bikes, vehicles. So if your organization or your business involves uh, getting out into the backcountry or um, on the trails with any of those types of equipment, um, that's a great thing to make sure you're keeping clean as well. And you can use a handy boot brush or even just um, a hose if you want to spray it down, just spray it down on land where you are um, so you're not moving species between uh, different locations. So yeah, just ensure everything's clean um, before and after you leave a rec site. And uh, the other thing that can help with this as well is staying on designated trails and roads, which generally, uh, not all the time, but are uh, maintained and, and invasive species are more likely to be dealt with. So um, for operators and guests, um, these easy to follow steps can make a huge difference in protecting native ecosystems. Next slide, please, Megan. So same thing here during the adventure, you're just double checking for hitchhikers, um, make sure your staff, your guests are not vectors for the spread of invasive species. And again, um, your equipment in this case, uh, in the photo we've got here with the horseback riding, um, you know, you're just checking that your horse hasn't picked up a um, bunch of plant debris in their tail or um, around their hooves. So just keeping an eye on those kind of things can go a really long way. Um, same, for example, if you're on a paddle board and you pick up some plants when you take a stroke through the water, um, make sure you ditch them before you continue on. So you just want to try to avoid moving any invasive species from one area to another. Um, next slide, please, Megan. So this is probably not going to surprise you here after the activity, given uh, some of the things I've said already. When you're moving to a new location, make sure your people, clothing, gear, vehicles, watercraft, pets, etc., are clean and dry. Um, this is a super easy, quick step that anyone can integrate into their activities and again makes a huge difference. So um, I think this is also a great area to remind guests when they're visiting Canada um, what their impact can be and how they can take action. It's not just up to staff, uh, guides, hosts um, of different tourism activities. So um, as I've been saying, these are really simple best practices that can be integrated into activities with only a couple of intentional but small changes to operations. Um, in addition, ecological stewardship, invasive species prevention and management offer interesting talking points for guides and hosts to share with their visitors as they explore educating guests while demonstrating the commitment of the tourism sector to environmental sustainability. And this is a big part of that um, long-term environmental sustainability. All right, Megan, next slide for reporting, please. Thank you. Okay, so another important action that operators and clientele can take to um, is to report any suspected invasive species that they see. In BC, we use the Report Invasive Species app, which is the red IAS uh, logo at the top. This is a direct um, line to the folks in government who work on invasive species management. Uh, my team and I have all submitted reports to this app and you do receive a response from the invasive plant technician with the BC Ministry of Forests. Um, so you do know that your reports are being assessed and managed. And these reports are really critical to helping us understand uh, where there are invasive species issues and to allocate resources to that response. Um, you can submit your reports of invasive species to uh, 
in BC right on our website as well. Uh, we have a couple of trained biologists on staff. They review these reports and respond to them in collaboration with the province, but also with the uh, regional invasive species organizations, which are based around BC and are an excellent resource for um, tourism organizations that want to take a look at what's in their region and have that regional expertise. So finally, I want to just touch on iNaturalist, um, which is also shown here. This is a species database platform that is used globally, um, so it might be something that international visitors are actually already familiar with. It does include both native and invasive species, and if you use iNaturalist, we highly encourage you uh, to join our I Spy and Identify project. Um, which contributes to community science and allows for our council to track invasive species as well. All you do is search for I spy and identify in the search bar and join uh, and click join project. So we do um, we do review this data and anything that is a major concern we flag. Um, but this data is also accessed by government policymakers, uh, scientists doing different research. Um, so these contrib contributions can make a really tangible difference in environmental conservation. And a few reports have actually um, inadvertently been of uh, highly concerning species that have actually allowed an immediate response to go and mitigate that uh, concern. So one of the important things to think about here is that tourism staff are often really familiar with the ecosystems they visit. For example, um, folks that are taking people on mountain biking trips are visiting a lot of the same trails. And because they are visiting frequently, they're also likely to recognize big changes. So um, tourism operators can be really instrumental eyes on the ground. But reporting is also a great way to involve visitors in ecological stewardship. It offers an avenue to to connect with the landscapes that they've come to visit on a more intimate level and to integrate a small, accessible, but meaningful stewardship activity into their travels. Um, next slide, please, Megan. Awesome, thank you. So um, I want to give a bit of an a more general overview of the program. We've covered some of the key content that we are trying to share and promote with tourism operators. And I wanted to share that with you um, for your own knowledge, but also um, so you have a sense of, of what this program um, entails. And um, so those are some of the things that you can expect to find in the resources. And we also do have a bunch of supporting resources, which I'll talk about a little bit more briefly in a second, but just to provide a bit of an overview so that you know what this experience looks like um, for tourism operators and what their experience is. So right now, um, based on our funding, it's primarily designed for wilderness and recreation-based tourism operators, um, just because of the specific types of activities that they undertake and their likelihood of visiting um, um, areas that might not have invasive species already introduced or moving between uh, areas where there are invasive species and are not invasive species. But we do welcome all tourism operators in BC to take this training and learn about invasive species and think about how they can implement prevention strategies into their own operations. We do hope to continue to expand and develop this program. Um, to address specific um, sectors or specific areas within the tourism sector um, as, as funding permits, um, for example, uh, you know, a, a module for hotels. Um, the program includes completing a 30-minute e-learning course or watching a 30-minute uh, recorded webinar. These resources are supplemented by additional courses, including invasive wise marinas, invasive wise angling, and are soon to launch invasive wise float planes. So these additional courses um, just get into some of the more um, the more specific content for each of those types of operators to help them to implement um, invasive wise practices in their operations. So. Uh, the courses are available to all management and operational staff and anyone um, for free uh, professional development on our website. Once a course has been uh, completed by leadership by a leadership staff member at the organization and they indicate a commitment to integrating these best practices that we've reviewed already, um, the operator does receive a voluntary certificate. Um, so this isn't something that we regulate or um, manage, but the expectation uh, through taking 
taking the course is that um, those practices will be implemented into their operations. And, and once they indicate that that is something that they will be pursuing, um, we support them with some recognition for that. So partners receive access to free support to implement the program into their operations if requested. Um, and, you know, a lot of these things are pretty general and easy to integrate as we've talked about, but for specific areas, it um, can sometimes just be handy to have that in-person guidance. So those um, conversations are always available to folks who are uh, wanting to look at how to integrate these practices into their operations. We also provide um, a series of free resources once um, operators join the program, they receive an order form uh, that includes things like aquatic invasive species, um, pocket identification guides or wallet cards for their guests, um, checklists or posters for guests. So they see um, what kind of operations are, or sorry, what kind of practices are integrated into operations and, and have a sense of what kind of work is being done um, to manage invasive species with the program. And then we also recognize and promote um, that engagement and that partnership, the Invasive Wise Tourism Partnership, uh, through our website and social media channels. So if an operator would like, um, they we ask them to send us their logo and we will put that on our website and also share it on our social media um, just to support the great work that we're doing. So, or sorry, that they are doing. So, um, and finally, just in terms of the ongoing connection and continued um, building of this awareness and partnership, we touch base with all tourism operators operators twice a year, once in the spring to check in about any questions, training, um, if they need any support, uh, restock their resources. And again, in the fall to hear about their experiences, feedback, ideas, success stories, challenges, etc. Um, okay, Megan, next slide, please. Thank you so much. So um, yeah, this was one of the big messages that we heard after our last webinar. So we wanted to just talk a little bit more about how um, folks in the tourism sector who might not be operators can share this message. And we had a few emails from uh, destination management organizations. And um, so that's, that's kind of what I was thinking of here when putting together um, this part of the presentation, but also recognizing that other folks may be interested in sharing as well as uh, such as community organizations or other regional invasive species um, organizations. So um, yeah, we would love, um, we have a one page information piece um, that is designed uh, to help share this kind of information. So we will send that out to all of the registrants for this uh, webinars so that if you are a destination marketing organization or other organization who would like to share this information and this um, free learning resource um, to tourism operators in your area, that that is available to you to do uh, fairly easily. So yeah, we'll send that out and, and encourage you to um, send it out to those in your network uh, the next time you send out an email um, newsletter, or um, if you want to just send it out, we're also happy to help with that. Um, we want to encourage everyone to consider how you can implement these best practices into your own activities. Um, if you are ever taking out media or representatives of partner organizations or hosting um, professional development or training opportunities for operators in your region, um, please share this message and please integrate these practices. Um, these are super simple steps. Um, just making sure your gear is clean. We've got boot brushes available at a really affordable price on our website um, and we often give them out for free at events as well um, so get in touch if you would like some boot brushes for your team as you are um, out and about promoting tourism in your region um, We'd also love to see invasive species prevention messaging on your website. So for those who might be planning to take a trip to your region, if you've got no before you go information or FAQs, um, this is a great place to include some, um, <clears throat> some of the information that we've talked about already, like bringing your hiking boots to Canada, making sure they're already clean. Um, and yeah, so if you want to include this on your website, that's fantastic. And if you want to encourage tourism operators in your region to do the same. It's great to see this messaging uh, repeated in, in multiple places. So please feel free um, 
to integrate that. And if you would like any help developing the language for your website or for social media posts, um, please do get in touch with me. My email will be on screen at the end of the presentation. So um, yeah, always happy to support. And we've got an awesome team uh, who has some, some connection to the tourism sector as well. Um, so some great knowledge here. So uh, for other organizations that might be joining us, um, like regional invasive species organizations or other community organizations, we would be thrilled to work in partnership to uh, welcome new operators to this program. So please get in touch to talk through an approach that works for your region and in relation to other invasive species prevention efforts that are already taking place. Um, for those of you who might have heard about the behavior change kits, um, that is uh, part of um, part of supporting this program um, being implemented across the province as well. And our primary outreach for this program is through attending provincial events like the BC Hospitality and Tourism Conference or the BC Outdoor Show, as well as um, through our existing partners, our program advisors and pilot partners, and through webinars like this. So we absolutely welcome your interest in sharing this message um, and really look forward to working together to do so. All right, Megan, next slide, please. So just um, in conclusion here, I think every time um, tourism operators are taking clients out on an adventure, uh, they have the power to protect BC's incredible biodiversity and stop the spread of invasive species. Um, building clean, drain, dry, and play clean, go practices into the business model is the easiest way to stop the spread of invasive species and really requires only a small um, investment and tweak to operations to do so in a really meaningful way. So tourism operators do have a lot of power um, to protect BC's incredible biodiversity and, and we thank you so much for uh, your support in that. Next slide, please. So I just want to conclude by saying thank you so much to our incredible advisors and pilot partners who helped us shape and grow this program. So just for some uh, reference for folks on the call, um, these organizations on the screen here, um, all of them with the exception of the Canada Nature Fund for Aquatic Species at Risk, who is our funder, but all the rest of the folks did play a role in um, advising us on what this program should look like, what it should include, what the key messaging is. So you can see that this program is built um, not only with you know the expertise of invasive species folks, but those in the tourism sector as well. Um, and when the program was developed, it was hosted by, uh, I think approximately 20 um, tourism operators who tried it out with their guests and um, implemented the recommendations and gave us feedback on what works and doesn't work. So that's how um, this program came to be today. And uh, yeah, I think just our concluding slide there, Megan, please. Awesome. So as I mentioned, my email is available um, here if you would like to get in touch. Uh, we've talked lots about next steps, so please do feel free to share this information with operators in your region. I will be sending out an email to support you in doing so. This webinar is recorded, so if you would like to watch it again or share it, um, we will send you the link for that as well. Um, and it does cover some similar material to the e-learning course and the video online for tourism operators uh, too. So we'll send that out um, if you want to take a look. And yeah, based on these learnings, just want to welcome you to consider how your activity or how you can integrate Clean Drain Dry and Play Clean Go into your activities. And that covers everything for today. Thank you so much. 